Future trading involves risk and is not suitable for all investors. Content provided in this segment is meant for educational purposes and is not a solicitation to buy or sell commodities. Hello, welcome to another edition of The Grain Feed, brought to you by EverAg. This is your weekly news feed for all things grain and all things feed. Each week, we bring you updates on the markets with unique perspectives from an amazing team of analysts with the intention of helping dairy and livestock producers manage their risk. I'm your host, Jim Matthews, reporting from the Chicago office on a lovely spring morning in the Midwest, following what has been a cool and wet stretch for the past few weeks, so very nice to see. Joining me today from Wisconsin, dairy broker and agent, grain and feed advisor, consultant, utility player, you name it, everything ever ag, Jenny Wackershauser, and fellow good old boy from Illinois, grain broker and marketing advisor, Michael Long. Team, how are we today? Doing great today, Jim. We're good, Jim, and, and may the 4th be with you today. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Jenny. That's very nice. How, how do I respond to that? Do I just say, like, and, I have no idea. and the 4th be with you as well or something? Or? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I'm not good at it. Um, but I, I appreciate the sentiments. And yes, happy days to all of you Star Wars fans out there. Congratulations. <laughs> um, we've got a lot to run through today because the biggest force of the spring lately has been the U.S. farmer and their planting progress. So we'll get to that here in a second. But first, Paige, if you would kindly timestamp the broadcast, it is Thursday morning. Markets are lower. When we last recorded one week ago, we appeared to be in somewhat of a free fall, especially in the corn market, we took July futures easily through six bucks, Dees futures through 550. We appear to have stabilized somewhat this week. The screens are slightly red today, Thursday, but we had a nice recovery yesterday on Wednesday in the corn market. So perhaps Dees futures stabilizing near that 525 target area on corn. Soybean meal. That stubborn little byproduct has finally pushed through $400 per ton and closed below there yesterday in the December meal futures contract and are trying to make their way towards 390 this morning. So perhaps seeing a little bit more of that relief we've been hoping for in the protein space. But back to grain. A lot to chat about lately in the market. We'll turn to our expert, Michael, in Illinois. Michael What's going on in the grain markets this week? Thanks, Jim. Uh, just like you alluded to, planting is is in the mind right now. Uh, on Monday, we reported that corn planting was 26% nationwide, which is right in line with uh, the five-year average. Uh, standout for that was that corn was 40% planted in Illinois, which is ahead of average. But as you look to some of the northern states, they are behind in corn, which, you know, not surprising with it being cold out. Uh, soybeans, maybe a little bit different. We're starting to see a, a trend where more farmers plant beans first. And uh, beans were 19% planted as of Monday versus the five-year average of 11. And so same type of thing. You're seeing Illinois really sticking out ahead of their average, but you've got the northern states are a little behind, so we'll need to see them step up in the next few weeks. Uh, something that I've heard from a few different people uh, talking about central Illinois, you know, there's people that are done planting, there's people that have done beans, some that have done corn, but in general, it seems like they've had a, a good window, and I think that's where a lot of the progress is coming from. The other comment I've got from a lot of them is they haven't had any rain, and so if you if you saw the drought monitor map this morning, the central third of Illinois really jumped out and is now abnormally dry, which wasn't a week ago. And so something to maybe start thinking about there. Uh, the other thing to think about with the planting progress is going to be spring wheat. Spring wheat nationwide was only 12% planted as of Monday, and the five-year average on that is 22%. So they are a little behind. Hopefully they are able to get to that this week. Looking at the conditions from that report, the winter wheat, the crop isn't great. Uh, we've got Kansas at 13%, good to excellent. Nebraska at 14% and Oklahoma at only 9%, good to excellent. So that's something definitely to think about here as we go forward. Yesterday, we saw a pretty decent jump in the wheat markets. Chicago up 30 cents. 
And I think a lot of that has to do with this conflict in Russia, some talks about a, a drone strike on the Kremlin. You know, not a lot of details from anybody on that, but overall it's it's something to watch out for because in the next two weeks we have the uh, Green Deal expiring or the Black Sea. And if things escalate between Ukraine and Russia, I think it seems less likely that continues. And so we need to really be thinking about that because you know, we do need those bushels of all crops that they export in Ukraine. Maybe the last thing I'll leave you to talking about the commitment of traders report a little bit. Uh, we've seen that over all commodities here, the corn, soybeans, and wheat, the funds positions are significantly shorter than they would have been a year ago. And so one comment like wheat, which we think wheat has really been kind of the drag on corn, a little bit lately. Uh, wheat a year ago would have had a slight long position in the managed funds, and today they're probably about 120,000 contracts short. Uh, corn's a little more dramatic than that. They were over 300,000 contracts long a year ago and are probably sitting about 50,000 contracts short now. And then soybeans are still actually sitting long even after this drop, but they're only about you know half as many contracts long as they were a year ago. So a lot to think about there in the grain markets and just a lot of stuff going on. But I think the market really is just looking for a direction and any news it can get is going to dictate where we go. Yeah. Thank you for that, Michael. I think that's an excellent note to end on. The market is looking for a direction. So thank you for that. Jenny, we'll turn to you. Uh, let's keep your feed hat on for the moment. Uh, how is all this potentially affecting those physical feed pricing out there in the U.S.? Well, I'll put my Jake hat on here a little bit and try and try and be Jake. But as we've moved through this, what we're seeing is similar to last year when we saw the big break kind of in July. We're still early enough in the year that the physical suppliers are not necessarily being aggressive in their offers because we still don't really know what this crop is. So even though we're seeing sub $400 soybean meal on the CME on the board, it's hard to get, we'll call it normal basis numbers out from our suppliers in many areas. So as much as we'd love to get some guys locked in on some of their physical needs here, it's been a little bit of a struggle this week to get attractive offers or offers out there from the feed mills or byproduct traders, the different players in the physical side. And a lot of that is still, they've had a rough couple of years on availability and timing, and they don't want to be as aggressive on that basis number as maybe we've seen in previous years. So we've again reverted back to maybe using some option strategies, maybe doing some things on the board for producers to take advantage of an unseasonal dip, really, in our corn and soybean meal this early in the year to give them a look. It does give us hope for fall, also gives us some time to be really active. So I think our producer book for sure has been very active this week, at least in conversations, doing some planning and trying to manage this with hopefully some more downside as we go. Um, but really it's, it's the basis conversation has probably been more of the struggle within that, that they're coming down and they're not as on the corn side, we're seeing that coming closer to normal, but not not anywhere near where we were pre-COVID. Uh, soybean meal has been more on average. Canola is still tight. And that goes to we had two years of very bad growing seasons for canola. So they need to see that get planted and get going well before I think they start giving us aggressive basis offers for new crop. OK, thanks for that, Jenny. Yeah, the uh, from the board perspective, from the futures perspective, right, we we, we try not to catch that falling knife that was last week's market. This week, it appears to have steadied a bit. So again, mm -hmm. encouraging folks on either side of your program, hedge or physical purchasing, maybe now is a good time to step in and do some of that, especially uh, with your corn buying program. And then if this happens to be a near-term bottom, at least you aggressively stepped in and did so and hope for more opportunities, as you noted, later on this summer uh, or later in the year. Um, Jenny, let's then put your dairy hat back on. 
and give us the quick rundown of what's happening in the milk markets this week. Um, we continue to find some support here on Class 3 Milk at 1650. The story of this week was a little bit more Class 4. Had a very nice spot trade on a couple days here on butter, gaining back over 10 cents to the butter. And um, grade A non-fat dry milk had a nice bounce higher. So Class 4 has seen a lot of action this week and a really nice climb back in that pricing. A lot of that, too, has been driven on our second in a row positive move in the global dairy trade. So our friends in Oceana had another week of a higher trade in that. Um, a lot of that was a little bit of China coming back in. We saw China as a buyer again in this market. They were higher than they'd been in recent global dairy trades, not as high a volume as they traditionally have been over the last few years. But it was nice to see them come back into the auction. Meanwhile, the Middle East had stepped back. They were big buyers two weeks ago. They had stepped back a little bit in this auction. Um, part of that why we've been watching that closely has still been our U.S. cheese markets, powder markets. We really need good exports this year to keep some support in these milk prices. And our cheese has continued to be a little expensive when we start comparing to EU mozzarella. EU mozzarella has been trading in the 150 per pound area. When you compare that to our barrel price, yesterday we had a nice uh, two cent gain in spot and got us back to a 158 and a half. Really, our commercial team feels we need to probably be in those 150s to compete with the EU mozz to entice some of those export numbers and really get some of our cheese moving elsewhere and not going on to the CME. We've had a record amount of volume moving this year on the CME for cheese. And so that shows us that there's a little bit of a lack of movement on some of those export orders. A lot of that has to do that our forward curve is still $195 to $2 cheese. So as nice as that is for our producers right now to still be able to get some DRP coverage, get some prices, supported at 18 and a half, 18 something in the second half, because we've got over 19 in many of our forward curve, it makes us hard to compete with a dollar fifty mozzarella in Europe if we've got a dollar ninety five here in the US. So at some point as we move through the fall, one of those two values need to come together. We either need spot to come up and meet our CME forward class three price of milk or Class 3 is going to start to erode down to where those cheese prices in the spot is. So um, something to keep our eye on, but it is good to see that every time we've touched down here in the front month here at about 1650 Class 3, we seem to find some support and bounce back up. We've seen that over the last week. It's um, been a bit of a slow pricing grind for um, May Milk here, but a little bit depressing to be on the low side of these recent ranges. And it reinforces more and more why dairymen have to really pay attention to those margins and really pay attention to where their feed pricing is going to be come fall. Okay, excellent. Thank you for that, Jenny. Nice tie-in back to the feed market, as always. Very important to watch both sides of your dairy operation. That's what we're here for on the grain feed. We'll give Jenny a second to get the lights back on in Platteville, and then we will ask everyone for a bold prediction, borrowing from Kathleen and Phil and their podcast, Bold prediction. Right now we have Dees Corn Futures trading at 525. So, Michael, where will Dees Futures trade first? 550 or five dollars? Oh wow. Um little heads up here would have been nice, Jim. It's a bold prediction. I think we'll trade 550 again before five bucks. I think okay. five I think five dollars will hold for a while. I think five dollars will hold. We will trade five fifty. Before we trade five dollars, Jenny. I agree with Michael. I think I think this five and a quarter territory is going to hold this five twenty five and a quarter, and and we trade five fifty before we trade five. Okay. Now we started to flirt with five ten yesterday, right between overnight and then the morning uh, portion of the trading session. We got towards like five twelve, I believe. So we've we've flirted with that area but okay so you're both at 550 before five dollars let's let's widen the range a touch michael 575 or 475 which does dees corn futures trade 
first, 575 or 475? Hmm. 475. <laughs> Jenny? I think I agree with Michael again. I think we hit 475. I think it's going to be a hard, hard move to get us back up into that 575, 580 territory. Okay, so for the viewers, these two guests believe that the Dees Corn Futures Market can trade back up to 550, not hit 575, and then break down to 475. Does that sound right? Yep. Bold predictions. <laughs> I respect it. I um, Jim, what's your bold prediction then? Um, I think five dollars holds as well. I do think we can hit five fifty, but I do think we could also hit five seventy five first. So I'm going to disagree with you on that one. I think we could hit five seventy five first before the seasonal trend back lower with favorable weather this summer. I hope you're right. But I appreciate you calling me. I appreciate you calling me on it, Jenny. I hope I have part of me, yeah. We'll see. We'll see what happens. There's a lot of time. It's the first week of May. Everyone's already talking weather already. And it's not even Memorial Day. So we gotta we gotta stay on our toes here. But that's what we're here for at Ever Ag and at the Grain Feed. So team, excellent work today. Thank you both for returning to the show for your insights and for your bold predictions. We'd also like to thank Corey and the Everag Insights crew for their support. Thank you to Paige for her production magic. And thank you to the viewers for watching the Grain Feed. Contact information is on the screen. We greatly appreciate your feedback. That's all for today. See you next time on the Grain Feed.